All right, so hello everybody. Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, CH751 Mathematical Methods uh, Part 2. We are now on, uh, we're talking about continuous groups, uh, Lie groups. And uh, so I have introduced to you in the previous lecture the concept of the generator of a group. Is my voice clear? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, so, so what we see is that, for instance, for translation, the generator is nothing more uh, than the derivative in a certain direction, right? And then for uh, for rotations around the z-axis, the the generator is given by by this complicated looking operator, right? So uh, we'll continue talking about this. Locational symmetry, which is described by the group SO3. And actually it turns out that uh, you can also describe it using the group SU2. Uh, there is a homomorphism um, from SU2 to SO3. So we'll, we'll talk about it at some point. So rotational symmetry uh, is the, is well, what happens when you have uh, a system which is invariant under rotation, right? So what is the statement? The statement is the following, right? We start with some function which is defined in on a plane. Well, for the time being, I'm, I've taken it as being defined on the plane. You can take it to be a function defined on in three dimensions, x, y, z, but I'm just ignoring the z dependence for the time being. Now, we want to consider the case when there are very, very small uh, when the transformation is very small. So in this case, the rotations should be infinitesimal. Right? So infinitesimal rotation means that cosine theta and sine theta can be replaced by, uh, by one and, and delta theta respectively. So now instead of theta, I'm writing delta theta because it's some small number. And this matrix, this is now, this is a rotation matrix. And it takes this form, uh, which is this identity plus this component here, uh, plus a second matrix. So we'll come back to this form a little bit later, okay? Uh, now, if you, Substitute this, these, these uh, expressions for cosine and sine. Okay, what happens here? It is, I think I'm sorry. Yeah. If you replace these expressions for cosine and sine in the definition of the function, right? You can now write your function as x uh, plus some displacement and y plus some displacement. The only thing is that the displacement depends on the other coordinate, right? But we can, we are going to still treat it as a, as a delta y, okay? So this E1, this is our, uh, this is our, our delta x, right? And this is our, Delta Y. And uh, well, I, can, I should write this as X plus E1 because I put the minus sign in the definition of epsilon. Y. So then we use the Taylor expansion. Now, I presume I, everybody, and does everybody understand what I'm doing here when I'm using this Taylor expansion? Um, can you please uh, raise your hand if you, uh, uh, know what the Taylor series is 
for multiple variables. And in the zoom window, if you know what the Taylor series is for multiple variables, I'm not seeing any hands. So that means that, okay, you're not familiar with it, right? Is that correct? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so that means that's a yes, you're not familiar with it, or yes, you are familiar with it? No, we have not studied it before. Right, okay. So let me just, uh, so I'll come back uh, to that in the next part. First, let me point out one thing. That this LZ, right? We get this expression. This LZ, do you recognize this LZ from somewhere? Does this remind you of something? Angular Does this look? This is the Z component of the angular momentum, right? The angular momentum operator. Okay. And this, does this make sense? Well, let's go back to the case of translations. In the, the translational case, our generators are d by dx and d by dy, right? So which, which uh, operator does do these correspond to? These are also, they also correspond to operators, no? which operator, the momentum operator. Right? So the momentum operator is the generator of translation and the angular momentum operator is the generator of rotations. Okay? That's one way to look at it. Uh, the other way to look at it is that the generator uh, of some small change in some variable. Let's say the variable is, is chi. The generator, corresponding generator is the derivative with respect to that variable, right? So as an example for translations, for translation, this is clear. X goes to X plus delta X was the generator dx, right? For rotations, we have X comma Y goes to X prime comma Y prime. The generator looks very complicated. It looks like this, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have this kind of form, right? At least it doesn't appear to have this kind of form, right? But you can show that this is equal to D by D phi, right? What is D phi? Phi is the angular coordinate, which describes rotations around the z-axis. Right. So this is equal to d by d phi, right? So the generator of rotations also has exactly the form that we expect it to have. It looks a little complicated because we are looking at it in the wrong coordinate system. We are looking at it in the in this Cartesian coordinate system, right? But what is actually changing are not the x and y coordinates. If you want to think of one coordinate that's changing, it's the angle, right? Okay, now let me uh, just uh, do a recap of uh, this uh, Taylor series. For multiple variables. And see, if I, 
say if i mention anything in class like a tailor series or any other tool that you are not familiar with please don't be don't feel ashamed or shy to tell me that you have not studied this okay i will not think less of you for that purpose for that reason okay because everybody comes from a different background right and we all have our strengths and weaknesses so but you can only wo bata diya karo bas ha theek hai sharma mat that's all anyway jara lecture dekh le kya kar raha hai so what what is taylor series for one variable i think all of you know know this right this you are all familiar with yes no yes sir now so what i have used in the derivation for the generator of the angular momentum is the taylor series for a function of multiple variables okay now let's look at this as for the for the time being let's ask what is the taylor series for a function of multiple variables but where only one variable changes right where only del where only x changes so since we can think of this right as a function only of x the taylor series will only have the contribution from the derivatives partial derivative but now here the important thing is that these are the partial derivatives of x of y of x right because now remember f is a function of x and y right then your second term will be again the same form the second partial derivative will be involved and so on if we can do the same thing keeping x fixed in that case our function will have this form right and why because again we are keeping x fixed so as far as this expansion is concerned this value of this function is concerned x is a constant right as you go from y to y plus delta y so you get exactly the same series okay now let me write a function of n variable okay and then i will ask what happens to the function when i change my n variables by some small amount so r is x1 x2 xn delta r is delta x1 delta x2 delta xn don't be worried that i'm suddenly going from one variable and two variables to n variables the notation is very will make things clear i think okay so f of r plus delta r okay now what will be the first term the zero order term that will just be f of r right now what what should be the second term let let me just write down the taylor series for one variable just for reference okay so what is this this term here this term is delta x times df by dx right but when you have multiple variables you have delta x1 you have delta x2 till delta xn right so the natural what what will be the natural generalization of this expression right the natural generalization will be delta x1 d by dx1 f 
delta x2 right for each term okay now now this this expression can be written in a way which which will make things look a little bit well i think simpler which is as follows so the first term is this the second term is delta r the vector delta r dotted with the gradient of x right what is the gradient of f the gradient of f is just consists of these these are the components of, of the gradient of f right df by dx1 df by dx2 till df by dx right this is the gradient of f right so this is a vector whose components are df by dxn so when you take the dot product of this vector with delta r you will get exactly this expression right and now again if you compare this this expression with the expression for one variable you can see you can see the similarity right what about the second order the second order is is delta x square df by dx square i am not being careful about my partial derivative with whether it's a partial or a full derivative because it it doesn't make any difference right it's understood that in the single variable case this is a full derivative but that's the same thing so now for this multi variable case what will be the expression right so we want the second derivative of f right but now remember f depends on n variables right so we want the del square f right but we can't use del square del square is the laplacian right we we can't use that we want to have so if you want to take the second order term right and you want to generalize it to more than one variable let's say you have two variables what are the expressions you would get right you would get these two terms from x and y but remember that the, that it's a function which depends on both x and y so there is another derivative of order 2 right this is the second order derivative right so there is another derivative of f of order 2 which is this expression right dx d1 right so you have to include this term also and then what will you multiply this what will be the multiplying factor well you will multiply by delta x and delta y right and then there will be a factor of 2 because you know it's like when you do the expansion of a plus b squared right you get a squared plus b squared plus 2ab it's the same thing so here what is going to be the second order expression in this case in this case the second order expression is going to be of the following form let me write it down delta r i delta r i delta r j d2 f Oh, sorry, not not R. I should say X. 
delta x i delta x j d two f d x i d x j, and there is a sum over i j. So this expression, by the way, if you apply this expression for the case of two dimension, you will get you will get this expression, right? You will get uh, delta x squared. Uh, you will get delta y squared, and you will get delta x delta y, right? Because when i is equal to j. You will get delta x squared for i is equal to one. When i is equal to j and they are both equal to two, you will get delta y squared. When i is equal to one and j is equal to two, you will get delta x delta y. When i is equal to two, j is equal to one, you will get delta y delta x. But that's the same term, so you'll get a factor. Okay. So this is the this is the Taylor series for for multiple variables. okay so what i have done here in in this case when i am talking about this angular momentum generator is i am only interested in the lowest order term in the taylor series so the lowest order term is what well the zeroth order term is just fxy the next order term is going to be what it's going to be delta x times df dx now delta x is minus delta theta y and then there is going to be a contribution from the y derivative df dy delta theta x so these are the only two terms that are present right and now what i have done is i have collected these operators this operator is y times d by dx and this operator is x times d by dy delta delta theta is a common multi factor so i've kept that outside and that's how i get this expression over here right acting on f so is this like i mean uh is this clear enough to all of you does this does this clarify yes, any yes sir ha huh? yes okay yes. okay all right okay so this is review of the taylor series we are done with this this Put a little box, okay, to indicate that well. Okay. 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 So let me write down the expression again. F of x plus delta x, y plus delta y for a rotation is equal to f of x y. Plus delta theta. Uh, sorry, uh, I should say delta phi d f by d phi. And what I have said here is that I may I have said that d f by d phi is equal to this. Okay. And this is you, this is something that you should prove. This is an exercise. in a coordinate system so what is uh, when you go from x to the y coordinate system from the cartesian to the spherical one x becomes equal to r sin theta cosine phi sin theta sine phi and cosine theta right 
and the inverse of this is r is equal to uh theta is equal to uh tan inverse of uh z divided by root of x square plus y square and phi is equal to tan inverse of y over x right so this this is something well that you know is covered in the first semester of or the first year of bsc so i hope that this is not something that is unfamiliar to you right then what we want is we want to understand how to write down our partial derivative so we have d by by this this means tan of x and we are taking the partial derivative of this but f is but x is a function of r theta and phi right so now we can use the chain rule what is the chain rule so this means that this df by dx can be written as uh df by uh dr dr by dx df by d theta like this right and if you want to uh, write this in a slightly scalar notation you can write it as follows uh this becomes dr by dx d by dr uh d theta by dx d by d theta d phi by dx epsilon right so this is how you relate partial derivatives in two different coordinate system right and now the thing is you can get rid of this f this f is not important because this is true for any function right so this is an operator relationship you can do the inverse also you can write d by dr or d by d theta in terms of x y z right what would you do you would say d by d theta is dx by d theta d by dx dy by d theta d by d theta right so your exercise right homework exercise is to show uh that x dy minus y dx is equal to d by d phi okay now i don't know maybe you already worked out all of these expressions in your first semester of mathematical method uh, did you do that huh no okay so this is your homework okay so if now uh, i can take another 10 minutes right is that fine okay yes sir so now what what i have shown is that is that under the effect of a rotation the change in the function f to linear order can be written 
in this way right so let me just rewrite this expression over here so f of xy and now i'll put a z also okay why because when i rotate around the z axis z will remain unchanged z will just be a constant right so if i include this over here it's not going to make any difference so the first order term is uh sorry not delta theta i should use i should use uh, delta phi to refer to that angle so i'll delta phi and then l of z this operator l of z acting on f right and what is l of z l of z is d by d phi of f so what will be the higher order term the higher order term will be delta phi squared d by d phi squared f by 2 factorial right because once we have figured out that there is a single variable which is the angle of rotation around the z axis we can just put the tail expansion using that variable right so once again we can write this expression as 1 plus delta phi d phi delta phi squared d square phi so on acting on f which can be written as exponent of delta phi d phi acting on delta phi lz acting on f right so this is our generator of rotations right now one can do exactly the same thing and say that for rotations around the x axis or y axis what will happen you can apply exactly the same reasoning right instead of rotating around z you rotate around x so f of x y z will go to exponent and we'll use a different angle here i've used phi um uh, i don't know alpha lx f right and for rotations around the y axis you will get something exponent delta beta ly f right so alpha is a rotation delta alpha is the angle of rotation around the x axis delta beta is the angle of rotation around the y axis what are lx and ly well lz is this operator right and we have we have seen that what is this this is the z component of the angular momentum so i can write this as r cross gradient the z component of this so what is lx going to be right it's going to be the x component of the angular momentum operator and the same thing for y and you don't have to work out all of these things because you can just see by from the symmetry of the problem that this is what is going to be the case because once you have worked it out for the z axis for the other two axes it will be exactly the same for any axis in fact right so now we have these three generators we have three generators lx ly and lz but 
there is a there is an issue what is the issue the issue is the following that let's say that i i rotate around the z axis and then around the y axis or i rotate around the y axis and then that means after that around the z axis okay so this is one and this is two right so how would i express the change in my function f x y z when i perform the rotation around the z axis by some amount by an angle delta phi and for y i am using beta so i'll use delta beta when i perform the rotation around the z axis by delta phi what do i get i get exponent delta phi lz acting on x right this is the first rotation then i rotate what i have obtained around the y axis so what will i get i'll get exponent a rotation around the y axis can be written as delta beta ly right but this will act on what i have obtained earlier so i have to multiply this by exponent delta phi lz acting on f right and similarly in the second case i have the opposite i have the change with respect to y and then with respect to x i'll end up with exponent delta phi lz exponent delta beta ly acting on x and now here's the thing one is not going to be equal to two right remember for translations what was the thing for translation you can wrote, you can translate in the x direction and then in the y direction right or the other way round right so the horizontal arrow represents the translation in the x direction and the vertical arrow represents the translation in the y direction and it doesn't matter whether i go first along x and then along y or along y and along or then along x i'll get to the same point i'll get to the same function why because dx dy is equal to dy dx right so the operators the generator of translations they commute with each other but for rotations this is not true for rotations lx ly is not zero right ly lz is not zero lz lx is not zero right 
so because of this one will not be equal to two the result of a rotation around one axis and then by other, around another axis is not going to be the same and you can actually perform this experiment with an object any object you take a cone for example right and then we rotate it around uh, the z axis okay by 90 degrees and then we rotate it around this horizontal axis let's call that the y, y axis uh by 90 degrees okay so i end up with this with the screen facing to the to my left okay and the bottom of the power side facing towards me now we'll repeat the same process but with the y rotation first so i do the y rotation this is the y rotation right and then the x rotation is along this sorry the z rotation is along this axis right now my screen is pointing down right so these two rotations they don't commute with each other and because they don't commute with each other that is what uh, makes our group which is so3 right so so3 is the group it is non abelian okay so i'll stop here for today uh, but in as far as reading a material is concerned uh, please uh, you can read the section on continuous groups uh, so that like chapter 7 or section 7 of the lecture notes by uh, shri chen which i have shared with you earlier um or uh you can also uh, read uh <coughs> chapter 7 of wu qi tong so that's the rotations in in three dimension okay so it might seem like you have a lot of your we are skipping like a lot of information in wu qi tong but you can actually read read that chapter without on much of that chapter without having read all the previous one but shi chen gives a very simple explanation so that is what uh, you might like to do read instead so let me just show you what her uh, uh, explanation looks like like this right so this is continuous groups so3 so this is all what i have explained to you uh i have given you some more details filled in a few more dotted a few more of my i's and crossed a few more of my t's okay so we'll we'll uh, talk about this and i don't believe that r can really uh r can covers this but only very very briefly right but you should you can also you should also read ask him right no he right he starts talking in chapter 4.2 so this is what you can read chapter 4 section 4.2 onwards okay it's again the same material that i have covered and then uh what we will do is in uh, the next class which i suppose will probably be on monday or probably wednesday if there is no class on monday uh we will continue the discussion right so any questions so for those of you who want to do problems right i have given you a problem so do that okay uh, if you find that problem is too easy you let me know i'll try to give you something that is more challenging okay okay sir okay
拜拜。Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So. Ah yes. Ah,、uh, so just a question. When we're talking、mm-hmm. about ah、uh, uh, SO three has、uh, non abelian group. Mm-hmm. We consider two parts one and two, right? Um. Ah,、uh, like f of x co x comma y comma z on、uh, rotation of z will give us exponential of delta by l z f. Okay. That thing. Ah,、uh, at the end we reach to a point where we got exponential of delta beta l y into ah、uh, exponential of delta phi l z acting on f. Mm-hmm. But will not the, the two exponential multiplication will give us the addition? And ah, addition no, 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 because because this is the thing, right? Okay, no. So that that that's a really good question, and I'm going to talk about this in the next. Actually, I find out from my Zoom on the tablet. Let me just join again and share my screen. So I suppose you have two minutes for this. Yes, sir. We have no class. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. This is、uh, <laughs> this is a, this is a good question that you asked. Okay. So basically, the question is the following. That if I take exponent of some operator, right? Exponent of another operator. Don't I get exponent of the sum of these two quantities? Right, that's your question. Exactly, sir. And addition is actually commutative, right? So it will ultimately mean that no matter what order we have, we'll get the same thing. Right, right. That, but that this this is your question, right? And so this whether this is equal to Exponent of this, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because addition, we can just change the order. Right. And,、uh... Right. 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 So the answer is no, no. Only if the commutator of a and b is zero. Okay. Otherwise. You have to use something which is called BCH, which stands for Baker Campbell Hausdorff identity. Okay, so because what is the reason for this? Because let's say you have two operators. The question is: Is E A times E B equal to E B times E A? Right? Yes, sir. And that means the question is that: Do does E A and E B do these commute? That's the question, right? Oh yeah, it will ultimately signify that thing, sir. Right. Whether they come in. And so if so, if A and B are 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 not zero. Then e of a, e of b will also not be zero. Yeah, because、right? uh, even the function will commute. Because because you right, you can expand. Do the Taylor expansion. You do the Taylor series expansion. You get one plus a a square by two factorial and so on. One plus b. B square by two factorial and so on. Now we can, for the time being, ignore the higher order terms. Let's say a square, all the squared or terms and higher, and we just ask what is the commutator of one plus a and one plus b. Well, this is going to be equal to a comma b, which we know is not zero. 
So yeah. the lowest order, lowest order, it doesn't commute, and it won't commute at higher orders also, in general. Okay. Okay, I get it because normally we have the notion like if at all like there are like two exponential functions multiply to each other, then that right terms add up for numbers for numbers and not for the that's for numbers right. but not operators for, not for operators that's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Any other questions? No. No, sir. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.